Hi folks, this is Dr. Rob Sivers, and today we're going to discuss a very, very important, completely misunderstood by doctors and by patients and by biohackers topic, the topic of cortisol. <clears throat> and everybody, cortisol, 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 we must measure cortisol levels. I want to put some truth and some physiology behind the bullshit regarding cortisol. Okay, so I've got a a colleague, a great friend of mine, someone I respect tremendously, David Diamond, who does a huge amount of work in the research field of cortisol and adrenaline. Uh, so I'm going to refer to some of our correspondence between me and David. Hopefully we'll have him on this channel soon to either talk about cholesterol or cortisol. Um, however, everybody gets cortisol levels mentioned, uh, measured, and then all the, the doctors are saying, oh, Oh, you've got to take this medication or this thing for cortisol and MTHFR genes and all that kind of, Whew, I don't know how they get there. Let's go physiology. So, so put on your nerd hat, uh, put your pen behind your ear, put your little office pocket protector on. We're going to nerd out a little bit about the physiology and the science. And I'm going to go back 30 years to my physiology lectures. The adrenaline cortisol system is a crucial, crucial, fundamental, very early developed protective system for animal species in general and us as humans in particular, okay? And adrenaline, everybody knows what adrenaline is, everybody feels adrenaline. Adrenaline is an incredibly life-saving protector when we are dealing with external threats. So if you walk around a rock and there's a saber-toothed tiger, you want an instant rush of adrenaline to protect you and try to get you to run away from that saber-toothed tiger. And adrenaline comes from the adrenal glands. Adrenaline is a, uh, um, let, me get, let me get to all my notes over here, a dominant feature of the neuroendocrine stress response. Neuro nerves endocrine hormone stress response and the stress response is primarily designed early on in our evolution as a species to external threat but also to infection to inflammation um, to internal threat so it, what adrenaline does is number one adrenaline is triggered by the sympathetic nervous system, the oldest nervous system that we have. So there are sympathetic nerves that go to the adrenal glands that when activated, when the, when the sympathetic nervous system is activated, it immediately results in a massive release, a massive surge of adrenaline into our bloodstream, into the arteries, and it rapidly goes to the organs of the body, particularly the heart, the lungs, the blood vessels. And what adrenaline does is it overrides all of the other systems in the body, all of the other systems. So it allows our heart to beat faster as well as more intensely. So the beats become, instead of just being this, it becomes up, 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 up. Adrenaline speeds up the heart rate, creates more blood flow. So you've got an immediate awareness, alertness, and really provision of both oxygen and nutrition to the body. So the oxygen, the lungs are working faster. It changes our absorption of oxygen. In the liver and other organs, it overrides every one of the hormonal systems that governs routine energy metabolism. And glucagon overrides, sorry, and adrenaline overrides both glucagon and insulin and results in a massive release of sugar from the liver and other cells and also the uptake of that sugar by the human body, by the cells, to the extent that you can. It also results in a release and production of ketones and fatty acids, but primarily it triggers a massive surge in blood sugar. It affects all the organs in the body that are related to the stress response. Guys, when I'm just dragging, when I'm struggling, when I've got a bit of brain fog, when I'm feeling a bit down, or... When my blood sugar is a little bit elevated because of adrenaline, uh, because I've exercised and it's not coming down adequately, that is pro-inflammatory. And you know I love my coffee. You know I like my coffee with my caffeine. But there are times when I want a combination of an anti-inflammatory, 
I want a combination of some caffeine for that stimulant effect, for that mind cleansing moment that I use throughout the day. And I want to flip myself into deeper ketosis. Well, folks, the guys at HVMN, the ketone IQ guys have come up with an incredible product. So think about if ever you use a five hour energy or if, if you don't like coffee, if you're afraid of coffee, um, if you are relig- have a religious objection to coffee, but not to caffeine, Ketone IQ has come out with a caffeine enriched ketone product. So not only are you getting the ketone bump to help you, if you use this in the morning, if you use this when you're dragging, obviously not before bedtime, this stimulant, the value of Ketone IQ with some caffeine in it is no different than having a cup of coffee, except you're also getting the benefit of ketones. So for those of you adding MCT oil, adding butter for that same effect to your coffee, the bullet coffee, this is basically bullet coffee, except it's directly giving you ketones. Try it and see. Now everybody's going to give me pushback. If you're drinking coffee, if you're doing MCT oil, if you're doing butter, you're doing exactly this. Hmm. Now, let's go backwards from adrenaline. The um, autonomic or the sympathetic nervous system is controlled by an organ called the amygdala, which is at the bottom of the midbrain. Old, 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 before we became human. And the amygdala is the center point. It's an organ in the brain that governs the, the, the sympathetic nervous system. And when discharged, when you see and feel that external threat, the amygdala releases a charge of these hormones that releases the adrenaline almost instantaneously. And the, adre- the, the um, amygdala is closely connected to the midbrain of the brain and also affects the midbrain of the brain, shutting down c- certain systems and increasing certain systems. So it's a regulatory pathway that starts in the amygdala of the brain, goes throughout the body and affects the vessels, the nerve. So the ner- both the nerves, the sympathetic nerves, as well as adrenaline, neuroendocrine, neuroendocrine nerves and and uh, hormones. So the nerves can cause dilation, the adrenaline does. So those two work in conjunction to try to save your life. That's what they're doing, okay? And it's an external threat system. Um, but what you want is you want a massive rapid discharge of the adrenaline system, of the neuroendocrine system, and then as soon as the threat is over, You want that to be dumbed down. You want that to be cooled off. And the way it gets cooled off is as you get an increase in blood flow to the midbrain, as well as that signal from amygdala to the midbrain, you now have a secondary delayed response, a delayed response to something called the HPA system, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal system. So the hypothalamus is closely connected to the uh, connected to the amygdala in the midbrain. And the hypothalamus, when there's a rush of blood flow, when there's extra blood going to the midbrain, plus signaling from the amygdala, you get your neuroendocrine adrenaline response, your fright and flight response. And then in a delayed fashion, you get release of something called CRF, corticotropin releasing factor from the midbrain, from the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary. The the anterior pituitary releases something called ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone, and ACTH goes from the anterior pituitary down to uh, to the adrenal gland where it triggers the release of cortisol. Cortisol. And cortisol interacts with receptors in the cytoplasm of cells called the MR receptor um, and then also with something called the GR receptor, the glucocorticoid receptor in the nucleus of the cell. So it affects the nucleus of the cell and it affects the, uh, um, the cytosol of the cells and adrenaline's, at least in cortisol's job, is to come behind adrenaline and dumb that down. So adrenaline is the fright and flight, 
and cortisol kind of calms everything down. It's the anti-inflammatory hormone. And the two work in a wonderful biologic feedback system with cortisol being the more dominant of the hormones, keeping everything quiescent, and then having surges of adrenaline every now and then, primarily to protect the species. Okay, so that's the way that this works in a very, very effective relationship. And together with adrenaline discharge, you get an increase in blood flow, you get a vasopressin response, and you also get the alpha-1 adrenergic receptor response. So there's three responses, the neuro, uh, neuro response, the adrenal response, and then vasopressin, alpha-1 um, adrenergic receptors. And then you get all of that quietened down, and that's your stress system. And it works back and forth. Okay, so now let's look at the system as it's evolved over time. Well, the adrenaline system was designed to help us with external threat. But now, in the modern era, the greatest cause of stress, the greatest cause of neuroendocrine release is not to some tangible external threat. It has now become a stress response. So issues, things that bother us, things that make us um, anxious, stressed, angry, depressed, frustrated, exhausted, pleasure. So now it's become, instead of a protective to external threat system, an internal stress response. And things like caffeine, things like hard work, things like uh, frustration or anxiety, all internally also trigger the amygdala, trigger that neuroendocrine system, and your adrenaline levels are up all the time, or you're continuously releasing adrenaline. And while the cortisol response is happening, it's not happening in a biphasic way. You've got adrenaline and cortisol both being released at the same time and conflicting with each other. And we call that, over time, when you're living and internalizing and living a very highly stressed life, and yeah, we blame caffeine for this a little bit, although I'm very protective of my caffeine. Um, but that adrenaline response is always on. The cortisol response is always on. And guess what happens? Those hormones, the, those receptors that I talked about, the MR receptor and the GR receptor, and in the show notes, you'll see a paper on this where chronic stress, chronic internal stress, the glucocorticoid, the glucocorticoid corticoid receptor based on cortisol in the nucleus and cortisol in the cytosol, the production of those receptors is decreased. Just like we see with insulin resistance, you can get glucocorticoid receptor resistance, which means that the flame of adrenaline isn't being put out by cortisol. The two systems are disconnected and cortisol isn't working. So your cortisol levels are perpetually elevated, but that's not really the problem. The problem is that your adrenaline levels are also elevated and that high level of cortisol is unable, unable to stem the rise in adrenaline. So you develop then an adrenaline foundation to your way of life and adrenaline is very pro-inflammatory and increases disease risk. Your blood vessels are continuously activated, which increase your cardi increases your cardiovascular risk. Um, you're on all the time. You're releasing sugar all the time. Sugar by itself is causing damage, irrespective of insulin resistance. And you get this override of a perpetual adrenal response, a little bit like I'm talking right now. There's cortisol. There's adrenaline. But... If the two are acting simultaneously because they don't control each other anymore because the receptors have been downregulated, you've got cortisol resistance. And I've got a paper here by a guy by the name of Sheldon Cohen that discusses that. You can see that in the show notes. So when we are living a very high stressed life, it is as much part of metabolic syndrome as an override and breaking of that cortisol adrenaline sensitivity where they regulate each other is as much part of metabolic dysfunction as chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption. And the combination is awful. Because the reason we're eating carbohydrates uh, to excess is as a dysfunctional form of emotion management. 
And if on top of that, we're internalizing all the stuff and we feel this anger and the stress all the time, and we have no meditative outlets, we don't have creative arts, we don't have human connection, empathetic human connection, we don't have physical activity, we don't have spirituality or meditation, we don't have healthy sleep. Of course, adrenaline is going to affect sleep. We don't have healthy relaxation strategies. That adrenaline on switch that's on all the time is as much an inflammatory metabolic override as insulin resistance is. And often we don't talk about that. So measuring cortisol doesn't really help us because you don't need a measurement of cortisol to know how you feel in, inside. All you have to do is ask your spouse, hey, am I wired all the time? And look at your own life. Where built into multiple periods every day do you have moments of, res of relaxation? Where do you enter that meditative space that comes from reading a book, that comes from going for a walk, that comes from a spiritual connection, that comes from a, an enjoyable conversation with another human being? We've forsaken that because we're too busy and we're too stressed out. So my, my friend David Diamond, within an internal group of ours, writes this, and I'm reading it. I feel compelled to defend cortisol just as I defend cholesterol. I hear all the time, lower your cortisol. Cortisol is a stress hormone. Please, guys. Hormones are not psychologic constructs. Hormones are a part of the metabolic system. Cortisol levels increase whenever metabolism increases. Cortisol levels increase whenever adrenaline increases. Cortisol levels increase also with stress, but they also increase during feeding, during exercise, during sex. Activities which are not necessarily stressful. An illustration. People are prescribed prednisone, which equals cortisol. Prednisone is cortisol. It's, got an, it's an anti-inflammatory uh, medication. People are prescribed prednisone, which is cortisol, to reduce inflammation. Or they may use cortisone cream, for example, for a rash, for an inflammatory rash. Has anyone given any thought to why prednisone and cortisone are so effective at reducing inflammation? Because stress, adrenaline, rapidly activates the immune system, and then minutes to hours later, cortisol suppresses the immune system, bringing it back to baseline. So what David's saying here is not only is the stress response vascularly and uh, from a sugar and starch perspective important, cortisol also, together with adrenaline, regulates the immune system and the immune response, which is part of which is the clotting response. Cortisol, therefore, is an anti-stress hormone, reversing the effects of rapid stress activators, ACTH, CRH, adrenaline, the neuroendocrine pathway, on our physiology. So cortisol is anti-stress. And the issue is not, are my cortisol levels elevated? Is the, their cortisol receptor resistance? And David goes on to talk, say that this perspective explains why people with PTSD, anxiety, and emotional override who have abnormally low cortisol have autoimmune disorders from insufficient cortisol production or ineffective cortisol production, unable to rein in the sympathetic neuroendocrine system which is the basis of PTSD symptoms and potentially why people with PTSD and anxiety syndrome as a group are overweight or diabetic. Blow your mind. Blow your mind on that. So what we're dealing here with is where adrenaline overrides an already ineffective emotion management system it disrupts hormonal cycling, just like snacks disrupt that hormonal cycling, and eventually results in cortisol resistance. Interesting, huh? And that's why perhaps something like HIIT training, we have a sudden burst and then relaxation, might be a better form of intermittent exercise than going for a long run, which is where your adrenaline hormone is always up. But interspersing the two may be better. Switching from regular coffee to something like my robust tea that is caffeine free. Yep, you heard this from the guy who lives on coffee. 
but I'm making that switch. I'm, I'm not stopping my coffee because there's value to that rise from the caffeine, but I'm now modifying it somewhat. I'm modifying that somewhat. Drinking some raw milk instead of water if you're not fat like I am. My son gets raw milk twice a day. Better than water. And this comes from a woman by the name of Catherine Crofts, who is brilliant. She works down in New Zealand. I believe she's in New Zealand, either New Zealand or Australia. Kind of the same thing. Yes, I said, no, I didn't say that. On the rugby pitch, we like to, we like to beat uh, New Zealand more so than Australia. But having said so, Catherine Crofts, C-R-O-F-T-S, is brilliant in our space. And so many people in North America don't know her. Google her. She's a brilliant thinker. But again, this is what we're exploring. Is the relationship between cortisol and adrenaline. And the problem is actually cortisol, not adrenaline. So um, the cortisol system, the HPA system, the hypothalamopituitary-adrenal system, is different from insulin in that there are multiple categories of cortisol receptors, including the MR and GR receptors, that can, you can develop resistance to. There is a powerful negative feedback system in which cortisol release activates the GR receptors in the pituitary and hypothalamus, which suppresses, decreases ACTH and CRH release, and therefore suppresses cortisol release from the, adrenaline, from the adrenal glands. And if you've got a lowering of cortisol release, that also makes sure that the adrenaline system is elevated. So we see both cortisol resistance, we've got high levels, as well as low cortisol levels. But the, the overriding issue is not cortisol, it's perpetual adre uh, neuroendocrine adrenaline system that stays raised up. So whether you have chronically elevated cortisol or chronically low unresponsive cortisol, they both cause the same problem. And cortisol resistance can occur with intense and chronic stress. There is evidence of a decrease in the sensitivity of immune cells to the cortisol-mediated termination of the inflammatory response. So the immune system continues to work excessively or aggressively far more than it should. And I've got another paper in this where, where we discuss that. So look in the show notes. But cortisol is crucial and appropriate for reigning in the immune system. So a quote from this paper, without appropriate cortisol regulation of the local cytokine response, the inflammatory response, there would be an exaggerated expression of the signs, for example, of an upper respiratory tract infection, where you get kind of asthma symptoms, which are generated by the pro-inflammatory response in an unrelenting manner. So intense and chronic stress can downregulate cortisol's ability to suppress the pro-inflammatory response, leaving you in a constant state of inflammation, mediated by immune cells that are not controlled, and this contributes to stress-related sickness, which helps to explain the role of autoimmune disease in health. So there is so much to explore here, but understand that the best thing you can do for metabolic health, apart from addressing your carbohydrate and your dysfunctional emotion management system with carbohydrate addiction, is also to regularly each day highlight, prioritize intentional stress relaxation. Where you may have your mind cleansing moment, Kingfisher rooibos tea, or you may just go for a little walk, you may have some prayer time, you may call a friend, you may chat with your wife. Things that decrease stress. And cycling that stress response is as important as cycling your hormonal response to sugar. So the final thing I'll tell you is, in my practice, I've started using the following talking points. And it's worth you spending some time thinking about these talking point exchanges that are much abused in the ketogenic space, in my opinion. First of all, we should be talking about adrenaline and stress level rather than cortisol. Cortisol being the anti-stress hormone. We should be prioritizing inflammation and anti-inflammation, both in terms of behavior, medications, and diets, rather than talking about cholesterol and statins. We should be talking about natural or dietary non-manufactured fat, 
as an anti-inflammatory product rather than protein and sugar. We should be talking about fat not to replace carbohydrates. We should be talking about effort-based self-care, self-affirmation, rather than instant gratification of endorphin-activated consumables. And along this journey, I focus very heavily on the sustainable changes you make by being the tortoise that's slowly changing habits rather than the rabbit that runs out and makes a massive change and then crashes and burns. Metabolic health transformation takes time and consistency along a pathway of change. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. If I've added this to your thought process, I've done my job. Shout out to David Diamond. And if you like this, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. Or if you want to consult, 561-517-0642. Take care.